Oh, well, he's very popular, Ed. The sportos, the motorheads, geeks, sluts, bloods, wasteoids, dweebies, dickheads. They all adore him. They think he's a righteous dude. That is why I have got to catch him this time. To show these kids that the example he sets is a first-class ticket to nowhere. Oh, Ed, you sounded like Dirty Harry just then. Really? Uh-huh. This is Beyond Reality Radio on a late night Monday. J.V. Johnson and Jason Hawes both have the night off. Bruce Marcus and filling in for them over the next couple of hours. Uh, we are going to be talking now about um, very interesting but very controversial theory, the whole idea of the flat earth. And uh, for the next hour and a half, that is going to be our main topic of discussion here on Beyond Reality Radio. We have two guests joining us. Uh, one is Mark Sargent. He is an author. Uh, he has a Facebook page, Flat Earth Clues, and a book called Flat Earth Clues as well. Uh, are we inside a Truman Show enclosed world thousands of miles wide? Uh, we're going to learn a little bit about that from Mark. Also joining us uh, is Patricia Steer. Uh, Patricia is also a Flat Earth believer and can be found on the YouTube channel Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. So let's bring up our two guests, Patricia Steer and Mark Sargent. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for being with us on Beyond Reality Radio. Thank you so much for inviting us, Patricia. Yeah, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Mark, let's um, let's begin with you. Mm -hmm. um, grew up in the state of Washington. Yeah. You started your career playing computer games professionally yeah. in Boulder, Colorado. Yeah. And then from there, you went and did something totally different. You um, were training people in proprietary software. You did that for about 20 years. Yeah. And then suddenly, 2014, you started looking into um, what is... Um, this interesting conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. um, some have called it ridiculous. Others call it very legitimate. It has um, created tremendous debate on both sides, this whole idea of the flat earth. Um, what exactly, though, Mark, got you started into looking into this theory to begin with? What got me started initially was conspiracy boredom, uh, out of all things. I looked into just about every conspiracy you could think of. I, I wouldn't call myself a, a tinfoil hat-wearing conspiracy guy, but I definitely was well-versed in them. And to the point where, after about 2010, I there was nothing left. I was like, ah. and everyone had heard about Flat Earth. And I ran into a video in 2014, summer of 2014, that was done by a guy in Germany. It was talking about the flight paths in the Southern Hemisphere, how they didn't work out, how the, the connections were very, very strange, and that they only worked if the map was flat. And I thought that was interesting, but I hated it. Everybody hates Flat Earth when they get into it. And I spent the next nine months trying to debunk Flat Earth, and that's really what the t-shirt should read. I became a Flat Earther because I tried to debunk or disprove it. And then at the beginning of 2015, I gave up and I said, you know what, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to need some help from the internet hive mind. And I made a series of videos called Flat Earth Clues. And I just put it on YouTube with, you know, didn't monetize, didn't allow thumbs up or thumbs down or comments. I just put it out there, thought for sure somebody would call. And I put my phone number and my email address on the video. And I said, call me, tell me, tell me how I'm wrong. Tell me, tell me how you could prove the globe in a court of law because i can't do it I, I i can't do it now can i prove the flat earth no but i can create some so much reasonable doubt in the globe that the only place you have left to turn is the flat earth and that was it and that was three years ago and since then we've had hundreds of regional meetups conferences in multiple countries uh, a full-blown documentary which is going through the film festival circuit right now and next week, we're doing an international conference in Denver, Colorado, where Patricia and I will both be speaking. So there you go. So it's really, it's a, by a process of elimination, eliminating the idea of the globe, yeah. 
that brought you to the conclusion that, yes, this flat earth thing is a possibility. Yeah, yeah. And most people, when they look at this, it's weird because it's right now it's about a 70-30 ratio where 70% of the people believe it's some sort of building, some sort of structure with walls and a floor and a ceiling. Like, a, take your pick. You know, it's kind of a theory, like a snow globe. Uh, or a terrarium or planetarium, and the other 30% don't believe it's covered, but they still believe it's some sort of flattish disk, not necessarily in space, but somewhere, obviously. And then the rest is up to the people. And yeah, what you just said there is once they, they never go back to the globe. So they, everybody in the community believes in some sort of flattish structure, but there are several camps and there is some dissension in the ranks from time to time. We'll talk about that. Uh, let's bring in Patricia Steer. Patricia, you're from a different part of the country. You, I uh, believe, currently live in Houston, Texas. Uh, you used to be a radio DJ, so somewhat similar to what I'm doing now. I was not a DJ, but uh, obviously I'm hosting a radio show. Uh, and you also owned a women's boutique clothing store. So what brought you to this idea of Flat Earth? When I was in radio, when I wasn't on the air, I would sometimes listen to late night talk radio. Mm -hmm. And I listened to Larry King, a long time ago, and Art Bell. And through Art Bell, I got interested in conspiracy theories. And then as YouTube came about, the internet and all of that sort of thing, I started looking into some of those things. So when Flat Earth came along, I was already looking into lots of other things. And that was, uh, I mean, I was looking into things for years, pretty much as long as the Internet's been available. But I happened to be working at a clothing boutique in uh, 2014 when I owned in New Orleans, and I was looking at the disappearance of flight MH370. It's one of those conspiracies. It's, it was really hot at the time, and then they never could find this plane, and it's still mm -hmm. missing. And that sparked my curiosity. And then I became addicted to looking every day at YouTube and the latest updates on the plane. And then, of course, once you start looking on YouTube at any conspiracy theory, there are suggested videos. And videos came up, and I basically knocked them down as they came up. And some of them were, you know, minor things. Some were major things. Of course, 9-11, I looked into that. And one thing led to another, and then I'm looking at the... A video called Something Funny Happened on the Way to the Moon about the moon landing and was it fake? And another one called Astronauts Gone Wild. And then finally, a video by a guy I never heard of before named Mark K. Sargent. It was a series called Flat Earth Clues. Hmm. And I started watching that in 2015. And well, the rest is uh, Flat Earth history. Mark and I are now close friends. And um, we're on the same path trying to help people awaken to this truth. And you saw something in Mark's work that you didn't really see in other people's work in their videos, right? Well, there are many flat earth videos out there, but Mark's is very easy to understand. And I, as no insult to Mark, it's like flat earth with dummies or flat earth 101. Mm -hmm. It's the outline of the possibility of the earth not being a globe. And it's very easy to digest. The, the flat earth clues piece by piece and then pretty much you know sleep on it or take a walk and think about it and use your own judgment and then move on to the next clue and that is what i did there are other videos that would be considered very advanced and they're fantastic too they also wake people up but most is what i came across first and it did help me look at things and i'm not I don't come from a scientific perspective at all. Yeah. Um, it was just so easy to understand. And then after that, I went on to look at the more advanced sorts of videos that are out there. What happened to the women's clothing store? Uh, I sold that in the, in 2014. I got tired of standing up all of the time, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so the flat earth theory, this is what consumes much of your occupation today? Yes, in fact, it consumes uh, my day and even my night. And I'm talking about while I'm asleep. I even dream about flat earth related topics. So, yeah, it's, um, it's all consuming, not in an unhealthy fashion. There are just so many facets to it. It's not just, oh, the earth is flat or nestle lied. It's 
way deeper than all of that. And uh, there's the community. There's there's just so many different levels to the whole flat earth thing. It's it's very engaging and very interesting. Question for Mark. Let's talk a little bit about what this hollow earth theory is mm -hmm. and how it conflicts with your enclosed world model. Explain that hollow earth theory and then tell us if it does conflict with the model that you've come up with. I initially thought that because I, I got into flat earth, really kind of segued into it through hollow earth. Uh, I initially, that's how I started. I thought, uh, Hollow Earth, that's kind of a cool theory. You know, it, it, was, it was fringe. And when I looked into it, I ran into Admiral Richard Byrd, uh, the young, youngest admiral in the United States Navy, and followed his life path and realized that he was tied more to the Flat Earth theory than anything else. Uh, but the Hollow Earth theory does not uh, conflict with Flat Earth at all, as a matter of fact. Uh, of course, you're your basic hollow earth concept is that it's a globe, but the inside is hollow, you know, journey to the center of the earth type thing. But th the truth is a real hollow earth, you don't need much to support a civilization down there. Uh, you got to remember that 90% of our population lives from sea level to only one mile up, you know, altitude sickness kicks in around 7,000 feet. That's not very high at all. Uh, in fact, uh, commercial airplanes, are going at about 10 miles high, spy planes about 20 miles high. So even if you had a cavern that was, say, 100 miles in depth, 100 miles thick, uh, that's, that's way more than you need for just about any civilization that I could think of. So there's really no conflict. In fact, almost, almost every other conspiracy dovetails into the Flat Earth theory quite nicely because Flat Earth is a giant umbrella for everything else. Uh, there was only one that I ran into, and I could tell there was a conflict because it was uh, Richard Hoagland and the secret space program, and he backed out of a debate just flat, didn't even, didn't even call us. Uh, when he was supposed to show up this debate, he didn't even call in to, to bail, and, and I knew. I was like, yeah, that's the only one because there can't be a secret space program because the space program would be if, – if one space program is a lie, then they're all lies. So hollow earth theory – dictates that yeah the earth is circular it's a globe mm -hmm. but it's hollow inside right flat earth how far down under the ground can we go uh, that's an excellent question because we can even it doesn't matter if you're talking about a flat earth or a globe earth the deepest hole drilled is surprisingly shallow if you believe in a globe then the center of the earth is four thousand miles below us but and and you've seen the cross sections, you know, in every textbook that shows, you know, the the orange band or red and orange and yellow and uh, you know the white center, white molten center, and it's going, wow, that's pretty interesting. What's the deepest probe ever drilled? You know, half, two thousand miles, thousand miles, a hundred. Even if it's one percent, that's forty miles. The deepest hole ever drilled by the Soviets and the United States. I'm sorry, the Soviets and the Germans were was only about eight miles, twelve kilometers. So pretty amazing. So we, how, how deep is the flat earth? We don't know because we can only go down eight miles. I would suspect that there's something down below the, the magma layer, but it's not 4,000 miles. That's for sure. Question for either of you. You talk about this enclosed world model and it's been likened to the Truman Show, the film. Mm -hmm. For those who have not seen the Truman Show, explain exactly what that is. Do you want me to grab this? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Truman Show, 1998 movie starring Jim Carrey, probably one of his better works. You know, he most of his, his really good stuff was in the 90s. And what it proposed, the Truman Show proposed that in the future, the near future, we would create this giant reality show where you, you know, create this massive sports stadium. Let's say it's 20 miles wide and would cost a huge amount of money. And with had, but it was a complete terrarium. You know, the the sky system was artificial, the sun was artificial, the moon was artificial. It was all just a big light show, including the stars. And they raised a child to adulthood. It was a twenty four seven show called the Truman Show, and his name was Truman. And this show, this this twenty four seven reality show, was constantly. It was the highest rated show in the history of the world. And the the point was that eventually he started figuring out that where he was, this world that he was living in, was not the whole world. 
and you know through a series of production errors and when you're looking at this it's an interesting thought experiment that is okay how many people could you fool in this thing if you raise them from 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 babies uh what if you made it a thousand miles wide or two thousand miles wide how big if you made it ten thousand miles wide could you in fact fool an entire entire civilization given enough generations and the answer is absolutely yes as a matter of fact once you get a few generations in and anyone that could that's in on it any actors that would be involved if once they pass away then the only people that remain ha are ignorant to everything uh which the, we kind of talked about in the um uh, the movie the village by m night Shyamalan along the same lines when that was you didn't, you didn't even need a truman show for that and that was you just took some kids you you built a town in the middle of this wildlife preserve and kids that were in there you could tell them anything you want so they told them oh yeah we're living in the 1800s in pennsylvania and you can't go beyond this line because there's monsters out there we accept the world that is presented to us and that's what appears it's happening now we have just a less than a minute before the break but i wanted to ask you mark um just to make sure that i'm understanding this mm -hmm. so in the truman show there's one person who's fooled but right. according to what you and patricia believe pretty much everybody's being fooled yeah yeah yeah, yeah. The, the whole place everybody this place this place is so big that w what i'm saying is the bottom line is even our best and brightest scientists and explorers didn't figure it out until 1960 they were looking for the walls and the ceiling for a long long time and when they found out in 1960 they said yeah you know what we're not going to tell anybody but I, we'll get into the reasons why later our guests are mark Sargent and patricia steer they are believers in the flat earth theory it's a, a fascinating topic whether you happen to believe it or not I don't know that we can convince you one way or another in this short program that we have, but it is an interesting discussion, and it's one we're going to continue with our guests, Mark Sargent and Patricia Steer, as we continue on a late Monday night on Beyond Reality Radio. You're listening to Beyond Reality Radio. JV and Jason have the night off. Bruce Marcuson filling in for them over this hour and the next hour as well. We're getting set to wrap up our uh, first hour with our two guests tonight. They are Patricia Steer and Mark Sargent, and they are both advocates of the flat earth theory. We have just a couple of minutes, Patricia, before the top of the hour, but I want to ask you a little bit about your YouTube channel. Tell us a little bit more about the channel. It's called Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. Yeah, I came up with the name uh, when I started the channel in 2015 because I wanted to talk about not just flat earth. Because when I have guests on, I interview guests who are flat earth proponents. Uh, I want them to be free to talk about the other things that they're, they're into, uh, whatever it may be. So if they are, you mentioned hollow earth earlier. If they were from a background of hollow earth, they can talk about that. And of course, how they came into uh, thinking about the flat earth and, and what they're doing with it now. So it's a it's an interesting name. People tend to not forget flat earth and other hot potatoes. So, yeah, how, often show, how often do you do the show? How often do you do the show? Is it once a week, once a month? Mm, it's uh, once a week, sometimes four times a week, due to the fact that it's not like a regular radio show that, that you do. Uh, it is up to me to do it whenever I, I see fit. So sometimes there's a lot of activity happening within the Flat Earth community, and sometimes I take a personal vacation. <laughs> Are you surprised by how popular it's become? Well, when I first started in 2015, there were quite a lot of Flat Earth videos out there. It was easy to go through and watch pretty much all the new ones that came out in any given day. But between 2015 and now, it's exploded with all over the world, varying countries having uh, uh, I can't speak every language, so there's, <laughs> there's videos out that I don't even know what they're about. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's exploded to the point where it's impossible to watch every single video that comes out on any day. It's literally impossible. Patricia Steer is one of our guests. The other is Mark Sargent. They are talking about the theory of the flat earth. Are we inside a Truman Show enclosed world thousands of miles wide? We've only begun to tap into this subject. 
and we will get much more in-depth during our second hour. We continue with Beyond Reality Radio on a Monday night. Stay with us. Hour number two of Beyond Reality Radio. Jason and JV have the night off. They have earned it. I'm Bruce Markison. I'm filling in for them. And glad to have a chance to talk about a fascinating subject, this whole idea of the flat earth theory. With us are two proponents of that, Mark Sargent and Patricia Steer. We will continue with them in a moment. A reminder that you can follow Beyond Reality Radio in many different ways. Check out our website. It's beyondrealityradio.com. And if you go to the website, we do have a chat room. We urge you to participate. Love to hear from our fans. You can also follow us on Facebook at Beyond Reality Radio. Also follow us on Snapchat and Instagram. Many different ways to follow the program. Beyond Reality Radio on a Monday night. We continue with our guests, Patricia Steer and Mark Sargent. Uh, Mark, I want to pick up on something we talked a little bit about during the first hour, and that was Admiral Byrd, known for the hollow earth theory. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, Mark, to learn more about him. How exactly did he come upon this theory? The the hollow earth theory or the whole flat earth thing? The hollow earth theory. Uh, I don't know how he initially came upon the, the hollow earth theory. The, the story goes, because, you know, when he started his career, it was 1926, and he was, you know, in the United States Navy, and the planes were not very good up in 1926, and they were getting better every year. But the story goes is that he flew to the North Pole, and he found some sort of entrance, you know, uh, journey to the center of the Earth type thing. And he flew inside, and he saw, you know, giant things, and it turned into a science fiction movie, which I thought was interesting. But what was more interesting was is that his career took a complete 180, and the rest of his career, literally from 1928 all the way up until his death in 1957, he was looking for something out in Antarctica. The Navy just kept sending him out there, and he kept flying his own planes, for the better part of 30 years. He took a small break during World War II. Uh, in fact, all countries took a break from Antarctica during World War II, except for Nazi Germany, which is very interesting, leads into that whole Indiana Jones thing. So Admiral Byrd, yeah, he was, he was part of the Hollow Earth story and the Flat Earth story. So he didn't really find the edge of the Earth. It was more like a portal. Well, in the in, in, when it came to the North Pole, it was more of a portal, wherever this portal leads, and, and who's to say. But when it comes to the South Pole, or the Antarctic, uh, I do think he found the outer border, because I think that the, the powers that be, especially the United States and the Soviet Union back then, were looking to see, you know, they were trying to figure out the dimensions of this place. And whatever he found at the North Pole indicated that there was probably an outer marker, the walls. How far out are the walls? And I believe they were several thousand miles from the Antarctic coastline, which explains why he was flying for so long, decades as a matter of fact. And when they found it, that's when they locked the whole thing down. Antarctica is a no man's land for any corporation. Hmm. Patricia, I'm curious what... Um, and. Forgive me if I pronounce this incorrectly, which I probably will do, but what exactly is the Azimuthal or AE map? What exactly is that? But it is the map that many in the flat earth have used as a sort of starter map, as an example of what potentially flat earth could look like. And, and, let, and let, let, right? let me jump in real quick, if I might. Uh, the Azimuthal Equidistant map... Or AE map is good. Yeah, the AE map is good. It's as a muscle equidistant is a long. It's a mouthful. Uh, the, we we fondly call it the AE map. If you want to know what it looks like, and I know this is a radio show, so we don't have any visuals to throw at you. Uh, all you have to do is go into Google and type in the UN flag. That's what the AE map looks like. Uh, it is the North Pole's at the center of the map. All the content, all the continents are splayed out in, in different arrangements around the outside. Uh, although what is interesting, the difference between the UN flag and the AE map, the UN flag has no Antarctica on it, which I thought was very interesting considering it's such a large land mass, even by mainstream science. It is not anywhere to be found on the UN flag. Do you know why that is? Uh, yeah, out of sight, out of mind. I would have done it too, which is they, they don't want anyone even thinking about Antarctica. 
that's why it was locked down in 1959. Uh, the, the treaty that happened after, ab, ab, well, let me back up a little bit. Admiral Byrd went to Antarctica during Operation Deep Freeze in 1955-1956 and looking for the outer marker, no doubt. You know, officially, of course, the, the Navy will never admit to it. But after he found it, all the nations that were down there, and there were quite a few of them, the Soviet Union, Great Britain, Argentina, Chile, New Zealand, Australia, a whole host of others, they all left the ice like their lives depended on it, and they started writing up the Antarctic Treaty, which was ratified in 1959. And when that happened, it basically said that no country in any capacity will own Antarctica and no corporation can set up shop there no matter how much money they have, which is fascinating. Well, An interesting thing about the AE map, sorry to interrupt, it's right a little bit to do with a little to do with radio, which of course you'd be interested in. Um, the AE projection allows directional antenna aiming, uh, especially in the case of HF communication. So it is a you it is even if you think flat earth's crazy, the AE map is actually used for something. It's not something flat earthers are made of. So if somebody wants to learn more about the subject, printing out this map might be a good starting point. Yeah, it would be a good starting point. Uh, in fact, you don't even have to type in... I mean, you could type in AE map into Google if you wanted to. If you want to spell out the azimuthal thing, that's fine. Uh, you could also type in flat earth map nowadays into Google and just click on images, and the AE map will come up most of the time. Although I should clarify that if you see the AE map in space, not really what we're talking about. Uh, we're, we're saying that it's an enclosed system that could be anywhere, but it definitely doesn't have to be in space. For those wondering how it's spelled, uh, it's A-Z-I-M-U-T-H-A-L. More simply put, uh, the AE map. You can look it up on Google. Yeah. Um, let's talk about plane routes mm -hmm. in the southern hemisphere. What is it that's so strange about these routes and why do you think that might be related to this idea of an enclosed world? The plane routes was was one of the first videos that I ever clicked on in regards to flat Earth. And what I mean that by that is in the southern hemisphere. So if you're flying anywhere from Africa to South America or Australia down there, the the plane routes there should be a lot of direct flights over those major oceans, meaning the South Pacific, the South Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. And they're not. In fact, 95% or more of the flights in the Southern Hemisphere that, that, that happen down there, they are connecting flights. There's, there's almost no direct flights at all. I mean, a very, very, very small amount. And the connections, most of them go north. Uh, it, in fact, they, they double or sometimes triple the distance than, than they should. And it's, it's fascinating. And when you, what I mean by that is, you know, if you're going from uh, Buenos Aires to Australia, you know, why are you going through Houston? Why are you going through San Francisco? I've talked to a whole bunch of pilots and they all say, look, fuel is what runs the, uh, the airline industry. It's all about the shortest routes possible. And when you put, the, put it on a globe, they take these ridiculous triangle routes. But if you put it on a flat map, if you put it on the AE map, they become shallow dog legs or sometimes just straight lines. And that shouldn't be. That, that shouldn't be the case. But that's what always seems to happen. So why is that? And then you take it one step further. And when you're looking at the flights in the southern hemisphere when they get out over water where there's no nearby islands get up maybe 200 250 miles offshore they drop off in terms of latitude and longitude the the either the graphic disappears entirely or the graphic stays there and it goes into approximated or estimated mode well the GPS system, otherwise known as the Global Positioning System, designed by the United States military in the mid-90s, that's supposedly a 32-satellite system with multiple overlapping blanket coverage. And it doesn't do that. And In fact, those planes are gone. I mean, they, they do not. In fact, they stay gone. Basically, the, the system does not display where they are until they're about 250 miles away from wherever landmass they're coming into. They pop back on screen. It's quite astonishing. <laughs> Explanation. Sorry to interrupt, Mark. Yeah. Maybe the explanation for what I mentioned when we started this interview, which is what kind of 
what was a precursor to me looking into flat earth is the disappearance of flight MH370 went off radar. It went off the GPS system, so to speak, and they couldn't find where it was. Right. Well, why? I mean, supposedly yeah. they have a pretty good handle on yeah. things. Yeah, and, that, we, and the flights that Patricia is mentioning were in the Indian Ocean, and those were flagships. Uh, one, at least one of them was a 777. That's state of the art. And even now, years later, they never found them. It's just mm-hmm. gone without a trace. And we didn't even think about it. I mean, when we got into the flat earth stuff, that didn't even come up until months later. It's like, hey, what about that? <laughs> those flights in the Indian Ocean? And it's like, yeah, it made perfect sense. Just about everything we look into, and, and I know we'll talk about a few other subjects as we get into this, tie back to flat earth in some way. Everything ties back into it. Stuff you'd never, ever think of. Uh, they all seem to point in the same direction, and that is you're not on a globe. This question for either of you, does the Bermuda Triangle and its strange history over the years, does that tie in at all to this? Uh, yeah. Maybe oh, go ahead, go ahead. System could play a role. There could be something, I mean, I'm just theorizing here, there could be something involving magnetism. I don't know, Mark, what do you think? I, I, I'm a big believer. Let's put it this way. It doesn't conflict with the flat earth at all. Because I, it, in, a, in a flat enclosed system, I don't think we're the first people to rent this apartment by any stretch. I think there's older civilizations. If you're listening to this show, you probably believe in that al- already. You know, the sunken cities off of India, the sunken cities off of Japan, Bermuda Triangle, Bimini Road, the Bosnian Pyramids. Take your pick. So was there an old civilization in the Bermuda Triangle area that eventually got covered up with water and there was some technology down there that's wreaking all sorts of havoc on time space? Yeah, I'm not going to discount that at all. I assume you both have have flown quite a bit in your lives. um, And if that is the case, have either of you had a strange experience while flying that maybe lends further into your beliefs? Um. Hmm. I have not at all. I, every time I look out of plane windows, I see the horizon rising to eye level, and it's flat as can be. And I guess to some people that may be strange when they think that you can see the curve of the Earth out of an airplane window, but you really can't. For me, I've flown a lot. I did a lot of business travel when I was doing the proprietary software thing. There was nothing strange while I was flying, although a few years after that, I got into night vision binoculars. I was, I was tipped off by a guy over in the UK who said, oh, you want to see some weird stuff? He goes, grab some night vision binoculars and get let your eyes adjust and start looking up. And it really, for me, kind of turned into the whole 1986 movie They Live, which was most of the stuff that's flying around there, you can't see with your naked eye. And there is a lot of it up there at all times. And, but, and does you, in fact, do UFOs con- conflict with the whole flat earth theory? No. As a matter of fact, they dovetail even, in even better, which is, uh, I don't believe, again, if you believe in older civilizations, I think the remnants of our, you know, of our civilizations before us are still flying around there now and they're not allowed to interact with us. The question is, are they stuck in this building with us? Or do they have the ability to come and go as they please? That's the big question. Hmm. Our guests are... uh, Go ahead, Patricia. Oh, sorry, sorry. (laughs) Go right ahead. Repeat what you just said. Well, flat earth, if you are a flat earth proponent, as we are, it doesn't mean there are no aliens. There just aren't aliens from other planets light years away. They potentially could be from areas on Earth that we have never discovered yet. Right. Sounds crazy because we've all heard everything's been discovered before, but Flat Earth brings out the fact that indeed it has not. So that's why if you use night vision goggles, you can see crazy things flying about. Yeah, some could be government secret projects, but also some could be um, some other form of us but that have lost contact with us or maybe precursors to us somewhere in a distant land on the flat earth. Our guests are Mark Sargent and Patricia Steer. We will continue on this fascinating subject, the flat earth theory. We continue on a Monday night right here on Beyond Reality Radio. Please stay with us. You're listening to Beyond Reality Radio on a late Monday night. Jason and JV have the night off. Bruce Marcuson filling in for them. 
Fascinating topic of conversation. Uh, we are talking with Mark Sargent and Patricia Steer. Uh, they are authorities on the subject of this flat earth theory, which um, is controversial, but um, also um, very interesting, very intriguing. Uh, we mentioned earlier, Patricia has a YouTube channel, Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes, so we encourage you to check that out on YouTube. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes before our bottom of the hour break. Mark, if uh, you would, tell us a little bit about your Facebook page and also about your book, Flat Earth Clues. Sure. Uh, the Facebook page is actually run by the publisher, so I don't have any much to do with that. But the book is called Flat Earth Clues. It is a print transcript of the YouTube series of the same name, Flat Earth Clues, which you can find on the channel Mark Sargent. And it's spelled S-A-R-G-E-N-T. Or you could just Google Flat Earth Clues in either YouTube or any search engine and you will find it. I encourage everyone to buy the book if they can. But more importantly, go to YouTube and do your own research and ask questions. I see on the Facebook page, very interesting headline, how to know if you have been secretly brainwashed. Mm. I don't. I have not. Honestly, I haven't been to the Facebook page in, in quite a while. This The Flat Earth Clues has gotten so big and so wide that I, I'm i not even on Twitter or any. I'm only on really social media. I'm, I'm only active on YouTube because that's all I have time for now. I'm Flat Earth 24-7. I know how you know if you've been secretly brainwashed. I have the answer to that. Oh, do you? You had a if you had a globe in your classroom when you were a child. Right. The globalists, as we call them. Yeah. And that is true. What, what she says is absolutely true. A globe in the classroom when you're six years old, even if you go through high school, just high school, that's 12 years of globe. And after that, what do you think you're going to believe in? You're going to believe in the globe. We will continue with both Patricia Steer and Mark Sargent. Our topic is Flat Earth. Still a half hour to go. After the break, stay with us on Beyond Reality Radio. You're listening to Beyond Reality Radio. Jason and JV have the night off. Bruce Markison filling in as the guest host tonight. A fascinating conversation continues with Mark Sargent and Patricia Steer. They are advocates of the flat earth theory. Still lots of ground that we'd like to cover in these final 25 minutes or so. And um, both of you mentioned briefly uh, a little bit earlier tonight about UFOs and how the theory of UFOs does not at all uh, interfere um, with the theory of the, the flat earth that you both believe in. Right. Uh, let me ask both of you this. Do you believe in UFOs? And if so, where exactly are they coming from? You want to you wanna start, well, Patricia? It's, I'll, just be, I'll be very brief and start. Uh, it's a lot easier for another civilization to come from somewhere here on Earth using advanced technology or even technology we have to get over to where we are than to come from light years away. So it just makes more sense just on that level alone. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Which is, look, if this place was built then the builders what are the relationship with the surf the people that are on the surface you know who are the superintendents who are the janitors who run security uh, you know, what how many different civilizations are there and does every civilization that goes through this place eventually end up being part of the system you know do you know will we have a place with the you know whoever's flying up there right now with unified field ships when you know when we've concluded our journey mark are you a believer in ufos yeah yeah absolutely i've seen them myself many many times uh i've been waiting for one of the, i get jealous every time i read a story about somebody that says they have a, like a really you know sorry hate to use the cliche close encounter uh because whenever i see them they're they're up there pretty high distances you know when i'm looking with night vision but I was watching them for, I don't know, five years before I got into Flat Earth. Uh, where That was out in Colorado when I was living out there for you know 20 years. 
and I would go out. I, I loved I loved watching them so much. I would go out in the snow because the air was so clear and and so it was you know pretty high altitude. I'd go out there in really really cold weather. I'd go out in wind storms. As long as the sky was clear, I would go out and look for these things and was never disappointed. Give us an example of something you've seen. Um, I would see squadrons. I I used to call it. Here's a here's a quick one for you. I would call it a uh, uh, driver's ed. Because at certain times, especially during the, the fall and the winter when you'd have less daylight, I would see squadrons of UFOs flying together like they were tethered. Very similar to the, uh, was it the Kenneth Arnold, you know, where the, the term flying saucer was coined up near Mount Rainier in Washington State, where he said that, you know, they were flying in this V formation below him along hugging the tree line. And they all seem to be tethered together like, you know, there was a lead and then the others were just kind of following along, but they weren't completely in control of their ship. And I would see these things uh, it, at a certain time, like like in an hour or two hour period and just about any given night. And they could cross the horizon so amazingly fast without a single sound. And I could get to compare them to the planes that were uh, landing and taking off from Denver International Airport, which was only 40 miles due east of where I was. So I could compare them, right? It's like, nope, not birds. They're not planes. They're absolutely what I think they are. Patricia, how about you? Have you had experience seeing UFOs? Well, I have the uh, night owl night vision uh, glasses. They look like, kind of like goggles, I guess. And I've looked outside and looked up, and at one point in Houston, I believe in 2016, I did see something, and I don't know what it was. It wasn't a drone, it wasn't an airplane, it wasn't a shooting star, it wasn't anything like that. It flew alone in a way that I can only describe as random, the way some insects fly, where they're not going straight. They're just going boop, 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 like all over the place. And that I saw, and I thought I was seeing things, and but I watched it long enough and realized I was seeing something that is outside the normal realm of things. I don't know what it was. Um, I, I don't know if I, you know, a UFO is really an unidentified flying object. So, yeah, I guess that's, that's what I saw. Yeah, it fits the definition. <laughs> You're in Houston, um, the space city. We have to ask you about the space program. For those of you who believe in this flat Earth, the enclosed world model, does this make the space program a sham from top to bottom? Yes, completely. However, there are good, hardworking, serious people who live around Houston and basically live in Florida and live all over wherever there is a, a space program all over the world who aren't in on a horrible secret uh, who are trying to lie to us. They don't know. They're just building a widget to put in something larger and they're doing a great job with that. So uh, it's, it's the whole thing is done by compartmentalization and on a need to know basis. So even if I live in Houston, where we have NASA, in fact, Mark came to visit me here, and we went to NASA ourselves. Uh, it, it, that doesn't condemn every single person who works at NASA or who has ever worked at NASA and, and calling them liars. The people that do know what's really going on, I mean, Mark, how many would you say it would be? It's, it's a handful. Oh, yeah, very, very small. Just the telemetry guys. Uh, again, compartmentalization, I, of course, have to say that I respect all the men and women of the military. Uh, but what we're talking about here is Air Force employees. NASA, yeah, they wear white uniforms. I'm sorry, what? Looks like we may have lost Mark. Nope, uh, I'm, I'm here. We may have lost him. He'll, he'll rejoin. Uh, he lives on an island, but sometimes there's... Uh, wait, oh, okay. wait, you guys can't hear me? Oh, you're back oh, now, Mark. Oh, right Mark. That, I, sorry, I, I don't know what happened. I, I thought I was good. The... Um, uh, Sorry, real real quick. Uh, the space program. Look, NASA, yeah, they wear white uniforms. They don't carry guns and uh, they smile for the camera, but they are DOD from, from top to bottom. Uh, every astronaut in our program, uh, they are high-ranking Air Force people by the time they're done. Uh, in fact, just about everyone that leaves NASA, if they even claim that they were on the ISS, they come out full bird colonels. And that's no joke. I mean, if you're a colonel in the United States military, you know how to keep a secret. And 
aside from them, the actual astronauts and the telemetry guys, nobody else in the space programs know what's going on. So, Mark, does it's this the mean... astronauts who've been in space that know, not the astronauts who are training, uh, right. you know, because there's different kinds of astronauts. The astronauts who claim to have been in space, they're the ones who know and are sitting. Yeah. Hmm. So, does this mean the stars and planets don't exist? It's not that they don't exist, but they are not what you think they are. Of course, they're up there. You can you can go and, and look at them at any given time. But if this place is a giant ter terrarium slash planetarium, you know, and I know that dates me, but a planetarium, when you go in there and your eyes adjust, what are you looking at up on the ceiling? You're just looking at a light show. The planets go across, the moon goes across, you know, the stars twinkle. And, you know, if you take a pair of binoculars, when you look at them, well, depending on the type of system, they look fairly realistic. Uh, but they are not millions of light years away. We're talking about a giant building, you know, again, with walls and a floor and a ceiling where the ceiling might uh, maybe even be 3000 miles high. And the sun and the moon are tiny by comparison, maybe 50 miles wide each, about the same size and travel over this, over this thing like a needle on a record player. Hmm. The planets are basically wandering stars. They're energy from what we've been able to determine. They're not things that you can land on. They're not terra firma. Right. So your thoughts on the 1969 moon landing? <laughs> Use us while we laugh. <laughs> oh my. Uh, okay. Uh, it, it's Use it. While we laugh, I mean, it, not, that didn't happen. Uh, we we haven't. Uh, we don't have a rover on Mars. No other country has done any of these things that have been claimed. All the space agencies are in on it, and they're hiding the truth from us because the truth of where we really live and who we really are is something the powers that should not meet don't want us to know so yeah. that's the, my answer yeah the Apo the apollo program uh, it's it's worse than you think what i'm saying is and, and i think others would chime in is that nasa was created to keep this thing a secret for as long as possible and by that i mean when they found out where we were back in 1960 almost immediately you know they uh well i'm sorry 57 nasa was formed in 58 uh, the antarctic treaty was in 1959 and the space program was was ramped up very very quickly the the so the quote unquote space race and they went very very fast it was like what six trips in three years or something like that nobody died nobody got radiation poisoning nobody even got cancer and then in 1972 they said okay that's it let's pull the plug nobody goes there again no other countries even tried russia quit for no apparent reason and they've been milking it for the last 40 something years and only now is it starting to fall apart. But yeah, the Apollo program has aged horribly. The production value has aged terribly over the years, especially with HD technology. And they say that they can't now, NASA says, they can't get through the, quote, Van Allen radiation belt to go to Mars because they lost all the technology that the original NASA astronauts used to get to the moon. Right. So they have to re rebuild it all from scratch. Now, man's greatest achievement? Oh, you're telling me they lost everything? I highly doubt it. Right. Yeah. Here's the question that's been tearing at me from the start of the show. Yeah. And I've saved it for near the end of the show. What happens when someone gets to the edge of the Earth? Mm, well. They fall off? They float? Do they disappear? Well, what occurs? There, How do you number one, there may not be an edge. Different flat Earth proponents have different beliefs. Some believe that it, it's sort of an, an infinite plane that goes on as far as your imagination, as far as the, um, the, the endless blackness of space that most globally believe exists goes. But then some do believe there is some sort of edge. And there are many theories as to what occurs. One of those things would be that, like a computer system, it just keeps being rendered. Maybe Mark would address that since he's an expert in, in all things computers. <laughs> Well, I, I do believe in an edge, but it's not necessarily an edge you can fall off. If it were in a building, well, you're just going to eventually make it to the wall. Now, what that wall's made out of, take your pick. Is it a high frequency? Is it heavy element? Is it heavy water? Is it a unified field? Pfft, I, 
Don't know, but it's way, way off there. I mean, again, our best and brightest we're looking for for the better part of 30 years. Is it a cause? I can tell you what it's not, though. Is it a cosmic waterfall in space, which you've seen the pictures of, where the water, like Asgard, is just falling endlessly into space? No, not at all. If you're in a building, then it just ends, you know? It's But it's, it's out so far that human civilization, our entire civilization, you know, we're only, we only go back 5,000 years of unbroken history. We didn't even get close to it for the first 4,500. And only recently, only recently have we kind of figured out what is, whatever's happening out there at the edge was scary enough that they put the Antarctic Treaty in place and made sure that if you wanted to go out there now, oh yeah, you can go down to Antarctica, have some pictures taken with penguins. You're not going inland very far though. The military has that completely sealed off. If you could go to the edge, let's yeah. just call it that for a moment, yeah. would you want to? Sure. Of course yeah. I would. And, and in fact, most of it, it would change the, the whole priority of civilization. Tons of people would. There'd be entire congregations of people, religious sects, which would relocate to the edge if they could find it because they would think they'd be closer to, uh, let's say, face it, if it was built, then there's a builder. They are, are we getting closer to God when we reach the edge? Hard to say, but I know a lot of people would go for it. Patricia, you'd want to go? Sure, of course. There are people who are talking about doing expeditions through Antarctica, anywhere really, just to go see the, the, to see things for themselves. But, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. People who don't like flat earth say things like, well, why don't you just get, a, get on a boat and go fall off the edge? You know, chartering a boat, all the legal ramifications, the finances involved, and even to go to Antarctica, the training that would be required. And you'd have to be hardened for the cold weather and have provisions. And, you know, it's the kind of thing where you die for the most part. It's quite impossible. There seems to be barriers built into this place, like Mark was talking about the deepest that humans have drilled is about eight miles. Well, there seems to be a barrier as to how far we can go because there's this built-in element of cold. Right. And then... Uh, as to how high we go. You've never seen a rocket launch. You watch the rocket and the fire and the smoke and ooh, ah, and then it goes up and then it arcs. And then it looks like it goes across and then it goes down. It seems as if there is some barrier where we can't get into whatever's up there. Call it space, if you will. Final question for both of you. How long do you believe that this enclosed world idea or reality in your sense has been kept secret from the public and who has been so skillful in keeping it a secret uh officially it would be around but around again when the antarctic treaty was formed uh i believe it was first discovered in 1955 1956 by admiral Byrd, probably with the whole help of the soviet union because they were down there at the time and as far as the who the powers that be, or as Patricia likes to say, the powers that should not be, would want, would have a vested interest in keeping this thing a secret be, for various reasons. One would be academic, academic, second would be economic, and third would be spiritual. Uh, there is a potential for chaos if you tell the civilization that the world that you've been showing them for the last 500 years is not really the case. Remember, we were showing people the globe for hundreds of years, but we never got high enough to take a picture of it until the 1960s. If you were wrong about that, what happens to science? And they're just not willing to take that chance. Yeah. You agree, Patricia? Oh, yeah, completely. Um We've been shown a world that helps us stay in our place. And as long as we stay in our place, the people, the powers that should not be, get to keep what they value most, which is power, control. Our guests have been Patricia Steer and Mark Sargent. Patricia has a YouTube channel, Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. Uh, Mark also can be found on YouTube as well. They're both proponents of the Flat Earth Theory. Uh, I want to thank you both. It's been highly entertaining, very informative. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate uh, Mark Sargent and Patricia Steer joining us. We will be back to wrap up tonight's edition of Beyond Reality Radio in a moment.